thanks. I say thanks everybody for uh, inviting me and for being here. So uh, uh, today I'm going to talk about, uh, uh, you know, the first of uh, several lectures on uh, approximation algorithms for stochastic optimization. And I'm kind of assuming that you haven't seen too much of approximation algorithms before. So for the first lecture, maybe we'll do a little bit of approximation algorithms, and then we'll dive more into the stochastic problems. And you'll see how the techniques uh, extend from one to the other. So, uh, and as always, please ask questions. Uh, I'm hoping that the slides will be uh, uh, sort of accessible. The, uh, the slides, by the way, are available online. So if you're interested, you can, uh, you can go to uh, this, this website and uh, uh, maybe, you know, get uh, so so, so we're putting all the lectures in the in a in a inside gather town. Uh, oh, okay. So you don't Perfect. have to worry about it. Perfect. Right. So excellent. So, uh, so, so that's great. So let me start off uh, um, with uh, uh, the uh, a brief overview of what we're going to talk about uh, uh, in the in this set of lectures. So really, what is stochastic optimization? You know, basically the idea is uh, the the standard model of computation that we deal with in computer sciences. You're given a problem, you're given a bunch of input, you compute on that input, and you produce an output. But what if the data is not actually available uh, freely as we assume? What if it's not given up front? So in that case, either the sort of data, or sometimes what happens is that obtaining exact data is a problem as well, because uh, uh, you know the, the data might be noisy, and so you have to, uh, in order to get more and more um, exact data, you have to work harder and harder. So there's the cost of having information, either implicit or explicit. And uh, so we have to still optimize in, the, in these situations. And uh, the, the main premise of stochastic optimization is that there's a stochastic model, there's a probabilistic model. And uh, given this probabilistic model, we are going to uh, make some, uh, um, we are going to deduce information about the actual data without having the data itself. And uh, you, you'll see in a, in a little bit. So the idea will be to design algorithms which make near optimal performance guarantees and uh, uh, you know, under some predictions on the data. So that's going to be the, the, the main idea uh, out here. And really the problem is going to be uncertainty. And you know, it's, it's something that we deal with all the while. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to give uh, algorithms that actually manage to cope with this uncertainty in some some quantifiable, you know, some provable way. So that's the sort of main idea of these uh, three four lectures. This is a sort of vast area that goes back, you know, maybe to the fifties at least, and it's it's very popular right now. Uh, what we're uh, doing is uh, we're giving an approximation algorithms perspective. This has been going on maybe for about you know, 10, 15 years. And so I'm giving you a bird's eye view of uh, three or four topics out here. So it'll hopefully get you a sense of what's, uh, what's happening, where to start, and then you can take it from there. And, you know, as always, Google is your friend. You know, Google Scholar is my way of figuring out. You, know, you have a paper, you look up who cited that paper and you go on from there. You know, I use it as a Turing test, right? I basically write a sentence and see what comes back. Um, but please do ask, and I'm happy to give more references as needed. So good, okay. So, so four lectures, very quick uh, overview. Today's lecture is going to be purely approximation algorithm. So for those of you who've seen this before, you could actually pull up the uh, uh, you know, exercises and start solving them. You know, this, some of this might be uh, yeah, this well known to you. You can play with the exercises then. But those of you who haven't, this will be sort of, it's just a different perspective on algorithms. It's, it's, it's relaxing the uh, requirement that we want exactly the best solution possible. In the next uh, sort of three uh, lectures, I'll talk about a, sort of a multi-stage uh, viewpoint and adaptive decision-making viewpoint and uh, this area called profits and secretaries who uh, you know, some of you might have seen uh, uh, you know, in particular, uh, uh, so Jose, uh, Jose Correa and Jose Soto have been very active in this thing. So, uh, but you know, those of you who haven't seen this, this is a very sort of uh, interesting perspective on uh, online optimization. And so I'll talk about these three topics uh, one by one in the next three lectures. But today's lecture is going to be about just basics of approximation algorithms. I'll talk about a, a few problems out here and I'll give you a couple of techniques. And these general techniques you'll see will, will get used again and again. 
in particular linear programming is something that uh, you'll um, you, you'll see again it's a, it's a standard tool right it's this super powerful tool that we use all the time and we will use as well okay so what are approximation algorithms very quickly we relax the idea that we want the exact optimal solution we are talking about an optimization problem and we say we don't want we need not have the exact solution because maybe the exact solution is difficult to get. Like for instance, the problem is NP hard. And then in poly time, we don't expect to get an exact solution. So we are placing some resource constraint. We are saying you can run in poly time, say. Or in other cases, we, we talk about, oh, what about bounded space? I don't have enough room on my computer to actually you know, run this algorithm. So given this bounded space, I'm only going to get approximate solutions. What is the best quality I can get? you know, various resource constraints, so resource constraints like this. And I want to do the best I can. Okay. So you study the trade-off between the solution quality and these constraints. And these things come up very naturally. Uh, and so uh, in today's lecture, we'll just talk about NP-hard problems and a couple of classical NP-hard problems. We'll talk about how to approximate them and how to prove approximation, how to prove this. You know, A, there is the algorithm part and then there is the design, there is the analysis part. And so we'll talk about both these things uh, just uh, yeah. in, in the context of two problems. And the first one is called a maximum knapsack in which uh, I'll give you, um, you know, a couple of uh, techniques and another one called min hitting set. And again, you know, couple of techniques and you'll see some similarities and some differences in the two things. Notice, by the way, one is a maximization problem, one is a minimization problem, but this is, you know, part of the game. You need to know how to solve both these kinds of things. Okay. So with that uh, sort of background, let me dive right in and let me talk about the first problem that we're going to talk about, which is called max knapsack or very often, you know, we just say knapsack. So what's the problem? The, the problem is, uh, you know, you're given a knapsack, uh, you know, just a bag of a certain size. And uh, this size we'll call S. And you're given a bunch of items. And each item has a size, oops, and a value. And I have no idea why it's uh, rolling back. Let's hope uh, this doesn't keep happening. Okay, so the size I'll denote by its height right now in this picture and the value is written on the thing. And of course, so what happens is you can fit some of these items into the knapsack and you want to find the set whose total size is at most S and whose value is as large as possible. And you know, frankly, on a personal perspective, this is the first approximation, uh, this is the first like optimization problem that I saw when I was in you know, high school, I was reading some kind of book and they said, you know, here's a bunch of files, they need to fit on hard drive. What's the best way to fit these things? And I didn't know that we were, I was solving a knapsack problem. And you know, it took me some time. You know, I, I, I don't think I discovered, you know, how to do it optimally, but uh, we had some sort of rules of thumb. And today we are going to give rules of thumb with provable characters. Okay. So is the problem uh, clear? Now, does anybody have a question? It's, uh, Good. So this problem, you know, is, uh, is sort of well studied. By the way, one thing that I will always assume is I'll assume that none of these items are too big for the knapsack. So if there was an item which looked like this, I can just throw it away because I, I can't fit it into the knapsack anymore. Okay. So the results that, uh, you know, uh, the, the first thing to note, and this is probably you've seen this in your undergrad algorithms class, is it can be solved. You know, assu I'm assuming that all the sizes and values are integers. And in this case, it can be solved exactly in dynamic program, uh, using dynamic programming in size, which it depends on the number of items and the total size of the knapsack. And, uh, you know, it's uh, one thing you might say is, well, we are done. Why are we worried about this? The, the sort of issue is that in n bits of, you know, if I have n bits, the sizes could be exponential in n. The sizes could be as large as two to the n. So this running time could be very large. You know, 
In 32 bits, I could write down a 2 to the 32 bit number. But a running time which depends on 2 to the 32 is not all that great. So in general, I don't want a dependence on the numbers. So this is you know weakly polynomial or you know pseudo polynomial. I don't like this. So in general, what we might want to say is, well, what, what happens if the running time depends only on maybe n and log of s? Can there be such algorithms? And in fact, what uh, you know, this is a result of uh, Descartes says back from 1970 something, uh, this is a famous paper which showed that a lot of optimization problems that we care about are NP-hard, as in if you could solve them exactly in polynomial time, then P equals NP, right? So we don't expect to solve it exactly in polynomial time. So here are two things that uh, we can do. You, know, you can do many, many things, this, uh, you know, but uh, here are two things you can do. And the first thing that we'll show is that there is a simple greedy algorithm they'll get value at least half, 50% of optimum. By the way, I'll always use this to denote the optimal value of the instance, okay? So in this case, the optimal value might be you know, 10 because I can fit seven and three both into the same thing. Good. Uh, so I can get at least 50%. And you might say this is not the greatest ever, right? You know, it's a, uh, can't you do better? And in fact, you can do better. You can get for any epsilon, you can get a value of one minus epsilon in time polynomial. In fact, this time it can be polynomial in both n and one over epsilon. And in fact, if you haven't, you know, uh, uh, there are three results, there are four results out here. One, I will not delve into any deeper. Descartes hardness result this is a hardness result. We can look it up. The next three slides give you these three things. So if you haven't seen this before, uh, you can uh, you can uh, you know dive into this uh, some more. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, let me just go back to the gallery here. Yeah, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to give you this greedy algorithm to start off. I urge you to look at the others, but uh, let's not, uh, yeah. there's uh, only so much that we can do today. Actually, maybe, you know, let me do the dynamic programming thing. Just, just you know, to get us started, right? just to make sure that we understand the problem. Okay. So the, the, the problem clear, right? Please. Is there a question? Good, okay. So let me just, you know, very quickly do the dynamic program for uh, exact knapsack. And, you know, there's like a million connections that come to mind, but, uh, you know, I, I won't go into that. Uh, so here's here's the way you solve a dynamic program. You know, they're, they're, one way is to imagine this as a table, and I'm going to fill in a table, which is indexed by the number of items on one side and the sizes on the other side. And this, this is some table T. And I'm imagining that TIB is uh, the maximum value I can get if I just use the first I items and just use the total size of it must be. Okay. And so uh, one thing you, you, know, you observe immediately is that if you use zero items, then no matter how many how much size you get, you'll get zero value. You can't do anything better. Okay. Also, okay. Come on, guys. You can use. So suppose I told you, I want to figure this out. One thing you can do is you can say, hey. If the ith item does not fit into this size b. So if the size of SI is bigger than B, then you know this is the same as T of I minus one B. The maximum value you can get from the first I items using size B, the ith item is useless. It can't fit into size at most B. So I must have this thing. 
Otherwise, I can get either, I can decide to either not take the ith item or I can take the ith item So I can take the ith item and get its value, but I've used up its size. And so this is the amount, this is the total amount of size remaining using the first i minus one item. Or I can throw away the ith item, in which case I haven't used up any size, but I have to use the first i minus one items. And that's it. So, you know, visually what's happening is you want to fill this entry in order to fill this entry, you either look at this entry, which is this one, or you look at some other entry out here, which is this one. And you can fill this table row by row. And you can check that, you know, a simple inductive argument shows that this is this will give you the optimal solution. So you should just return t of n s. What's the maximum value you can get from all n items using all the size? Okay. So this is you know just dynamic programming for exact knapsack, and. Um, And, you know, if, if you know, it, it's more clearly written out here, if, if it helps, so you should have a look. But you can modify this in various different ways. For instance, you can, you should be able to find the set that maximizes the value. And also the running time instead of n times s, if the values were small, you should be able to run in times n times v as well. And so this is, these are, you know, useful exercises to make sure that you understand the material. Okay, but let me tell you the, the, the second one, which is perhaps the sort of more interesting uh, from our perspective, it's a half approximation. Okay, so I'll, I'll, by this I mean that my value, my algorithm's value is at least one half of the optimal value on every instance. So the, 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 the first, um, the, so the theorem says that there's a greedy like algorithm that gives you this uh, guarantee. And the first greedy algorithm that you might try is let's add the uh, elements in decreasing order of this bank per buck, the value divided by the size. Okay. And so the first observation that you will see, so, so the, the way I always think of this is, well, I, I take the first item, it takes up certain values. So this is, let's say S. The first item, it takes on certain value. The second item, it takes on a certain value. The third item, fourth item, and so on and so forth. The fifth item. And then maybe I'll finally come to some item which goes over. So let's say I'm just adding these items one by one. And I know that V1 over S1 is at least V2 over S2 is at least Vj over Sj or something like this. I'm just adding them in this order, okay? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to just keep adding until the first item exceeds and then I stop. You could go on, you could try, you know, is there any other item that will fit in and stuff like this, but let's just try this algorithm. So the first thing to note, and this is this is kind of a, a easy um, uh, thing to prove, is suppose at this point I could do the following: instead of having to drop this last item, I could take some fraction of it, as much as fits. You know, suppose this item was of size five, but uh, you know I had only three units of space left. I could take sixty percent of this item. Suppose. So then that is called fractional knapsack.
And this algorithm is the best algorithm for this problem. Because it's adding in for each unit of space that you take, you're putting the highest density. Okay. So for fractional knapsack, we, we get, this is an optimal solution. Okay. Good. Question. So this was this was the first fact let's say fact 2 if i allow you to take items fractionally does the optimal value go up or down it goes up i'm allowing you more i could allow you to take everything integrally but i also allow you to take things fractionally so the op sorry guys it's uh PowerPoint is misbehaving with me today. The optimal for the fractional knapsack is at least the optimal for the integer knapsack, which is what I want to solve. Okay. So I have a solution whose value is equal to the optimal for the fractional knapsack which is more than the optimal for the integer knapsack. Okay. So the, the question is, how do I get a solution whose value is uh, comparable to the optimal knapsack? Because, you know, I've got value from these items and from half of this item or 60% of this item, something like that. How do I get a, an, a, an optimal solution? Or, or how do I get a near optimal solution? So here's the third observation. Take the integer items. And take, so, so this is one solution and take this fractional item just completely. Okay, this is one solution. This is solution one. This single item is solution two. Now the value of solution one plus the value of solution two is at least the fractional value. But this is at least the optimum. So the better of these two solutions is 50% of optimum. One thing you might have, uh, you know, you might wonder is why didn't I just take this this first part of the solution? Let's say uh, these 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 shaded guys. Why didn't I just take them? So here is here is a bad example. That imagine that the first item. So this is this is s. Imagine that the first item was really tiny. It gave you a small amount of value but it took a small amount of size. And the second item goes, is too large now. Having filled in the first item, you can't fill in the second item. You should have really just done this second item. So in this case, what's happening is that just running greedy might not give you a good solution, but you just have to try, well, if I had, one more item that I would take. Which item would that be? So in particular, you know, here is, um, here is the uh, algorithm again. You know, if the fractional items were allowed, greedy is optimal. 
Now the problem is that last item that you didn't add, that might have had all the value. So the, the, what you do is you try either adding all the integer items or you try that last fractional item. And one of them is at least 50% of opt. Okay. So this gives you uh, an algorithm, which is uh, where uh, you, uh, uh, where you get a half approximation. And the, uh, in, in this approach, you know, you can extend to, uh, to get an algorithm, which is a one minus epsilon approximation. So maybe I'll just mention this. So you could extend, so you could guess all large items, items of size at least S over epsilon. Okay. How many items can there be like this? If the items have size at least epsilon fraction of the knapsack size, there can be only at most epsilon, one over epsilon items like this. And then from this, you could, and after this, you could use the, um, the, the strategy above, you know, this greedy strategy. Uh, greedy to fill the rest. So I'll, you know, maybe I'll add in a, a exercise in uh, in the sort of exercise sheet, showing that you can get an uh, a one one minus epsilon approximation. You can get within a factor of epsilon, uh, a factor of one minus epsilon uh, of the optimum using a, a a more sophisticated algorithm, not too much more sophisticated. And here is one that I've outlined which actually runs much faster than this guessing algorithm that I gave. But maybe I don't need, you know, this is only for your general knowledge. I don't really need you to uh, understand this algorithm right now. So maybe I'll move on. The, 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 uh, the two techniques that I wanted to mention, one of them was dynamic programming, which gave you an exact solution, but unfortunately it was, uh, you know, too slow. And then there was this greedy based algorithm we just said, look, there are two possible solutions. You can, you, you can try adding items greedily. And then there is this final item that you need to worry about. Okay. And this gave you 50% of the optimum. And then, you know, there are extensions which give you somewhere between the two. So you can go from 50%, which is a very simple idea to almost, you know, 99.99% if you wanted but it's going to take you more and more time. So that's the idea of uh, knapsack. And the beauty of the max knapsack problem is that it actually gives you this sort of amazing sliding scale. You know, if you want an exact optimum, this is NP hard, you can get 50% using a very simple algorithm and then no matter what line you draw, if you say one minus epsilon, you can get there. So you can get there in time, some function of n and epsilon. So you run more and more time and you get closer and closer to the optimum. And this is a, sort of a beautiful uh, feature of the knapsack problem. So with that, you know, that's pretty much all I'll say about knapsack. Um, if, uh, if there are any questions and people, you know, ask maybe, otherwise I'll um, uh, talk a little bit about the hitting set problem, which is going to, again, you know, feature again, uh, next couple of uh, lectures as well. Questions? 
Okay. So, uh, going once, going twice. Okay. Okay. So then let's let me let me uh, talk a little bit about uh, the hitting set problem. If okay, good. So here's hitting set. Um, the problem is the following. I give you a set system. So it's a universe of n elements. Okay. So think of these little boxes as being my universe here. And I give you a bunch of sets. So I've colored them up in uh, different uh, colors. So I give you M sets. And the idea is uh, the question is simple. Find the smallest, what I call a hitting set. So it's a set of these boxes such that every one of the colored sets is hit. So I contain one of the elements of one of uh, every one of the colored sets. So for instance, one hitting set is U itself, but it's a boring hitting set. I want a small hitting set. So in this case, uh, the smallest hitting set would might be like D and F is a hitting set. It seems to hit all the four elements, of all the four sets out there. And the question is, just find the smallest hitting set. And you might, you can imagine why, you know, such a problem arises. For instance, you, you want, um, you have a bunch of test cases for, uh, uh, for uh, your, your algorithm. And each of these sets is a possible bug. You want a smaller set of test cases that catches all the bugs. Okay. And in fact, this is a special case. Some of the ideas that we'll use for hitting set will generalize to something called submodular maximization. And uh, time permitting, we'll talk a little bit about this. Okay, but right now, hitting set. Bunch of sets, you want to hit all of them. Smallest number of elements. So NP hard problem. There are many algorithms whose size will be about log times the optimal size. Where log it's log of the number of sets. Okay. So the solution we'll produce is about log times the optimum. And if we are being careful we can actually get natural log of M times optimum. Okay. And we'll see two algorithms with this. Okay. Moreover, and here's this curious dichotomy, you know, it's actually, if you could give me an algorithm which on every instance produces a solution of size one minus epsilon ln n times opt. If you could do this, then p equals np. And this is a very, this, you know, um, is a very surprising uh, result. It's a, it's a, a deep result and sadly one that I won't be able to get into. But if you're interested in this thing, you should check up something called the PCP theorem. And I'm happy to give pointers. Okay. So this surprising fact, here is an algorithm that gets you within log times the optimum and doing any better is going to be intractable. Okay, so let's do, let, let's give two algorithms for this. And the first algorithm in this case is, there are no sort of tricks uh, in this algorithm, is the greedy algorithm. Pick the element which hits the maximum number of unhit sets. So you have a bunch of sets, 
you look over all the elements remaining, look at how many unhit sets it hits, pick the one that covers the maximum. And the claim is that this is an order log n. Actually, I don't even have to worry about this order business, log m uh, approximation. By which I mean, it always picks the number of uh, elements it picks is at most log n times the optimum. Okay, so, so here's, the, here's the proof. Let's look at, let's say m sub t is the number of sets not hit so far. After t elements, actually, you know what? Maybe you know, writing is, is somehow um, PowerPoint is messing me up right now. So let me let me go over this proof on the next slide, just uh, using stuff that I've already written earlier. Suppose m t is the number of unhit sets after t elements have been picked. And suppose just, you know, that you knew that the optimum was K. You don't, the algorithm doesn't need to do, know this. This is only for the proof, okay? So the first fact is there exists an element. So there are empty sets remaining. Opt must be hitting them. There are K sets in opt. So by averaging one of these elements must hit empty over K sets at least. Right? Opt hits all these unhit sets using k elements. So by averaging one of these elements hits empty over k. So empty plus one is at most one minus k, or one minus one over k times empty. Just, you know, these many elements, these many sets will be hit by the next element. You are running greedy. You are picking the element that hits the most sets there is an element that hits at least so many sets. Okay. So the number of unhit sets drops by a one minus one over K factor every time, at least. So after capital T, L, uh, you know, so there's a typo out here, I should say, after little t, elements have been picked. I started off with M sets and each time the number of unhit sets goes down by one minus one over K factor. And here now I'll use the simple inequality that one plus X is less than E to the X for all X in the race. So this inequality just follows from this. And now if you plug in uh, k log m, you'll see that no elements, no sets can be left after. k log m, many elements. So this is you know, opt times log m. Okay, good. So the greedy algorithm, very powerful in this case. Here's a different algorithm. I mean, this, this is a, like a, a very general principle. It's this idea called relaxing ground. And so the, the, this is this one idea. Okay, so let me tell you the relaxing ground idea. So here's the idea. I'm going to write down an integer program that captures this problem, okay? So this is like a linear program, but I'm going to put in constraints that all the variables must be integers. And this will exactly model the problem I want to solve. But the fact will be that this will be NP hard. So I'm going to relax the constraints. I'm going to relax the integrality constraints. I'll say, okay, give me a fractional solution. Don't worry about an integer solution. You are minimizing some quantity. So now your optimal solution will be at most the original integer program value. 
So this was the relaxed part of the uh, algorithm. And then after this, what we'll do is we'll round. So because the solution, the linear program will give you a solution which is not integers, which is fractional, so we'll round. So let's 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 do this thing. Okay. So here is here is an uh, integer program for hitting set. I'll have a variable x e for all elements e. And x e I'm thinking of as taking on values between zero and one. In fact, it'll take on values either zero or one. Zero means I have not picked it. One means I've picked it. And here is my constraints. So. I'm gonna say minimize sum over e x e such that x e e belongs to s i is at least one for all sets i and x e belongs to the integers zero one. So this integer linear program is exactly the min hitting set. You can say this is just a reformulation of the problem I wanted to solve. Okay, so I'll write this as IP. This problem is, this, this is NP hard. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to just say X E is bigger than zero. I've relaxed the integrality constraints and I'll call that LP. And you'll notice the fact that the LP value is at most the IP value. Why? Every solution to the IP is a solution to the LP. If you had integer solutions, which were one or zero, they're at least zero. Okay. And now here is going to be the next. So now I have to give you a round. How to round these things. So here is, here is one way of rounding, okay? Pick each element with probability. Think of these X's as being probability values, okay? And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll put in constraints like this. X's were between zero and one. So let's let's uh, pick every element with probability x. Okay. This will give you a set S. Okay, maybe I'll call it H. The question is, is H a hitting set? And the, the, the one, one sort of worry is look at some SI, look at, you know, you had some universe and you had some set, let's say SI. And what this LP did was it gave you, let's say 0.3 out here, 0.4 out here, 0.3 out here on these three elements and it covered, it satisfied this constraint. Okay. The, the question is what is the probability that SI is hit? It's hit if any of these elements is picked. So the probability of SI being hit is elements belonging to SI It is hit, it is not hit if each one of its elements is not picked. So this is the probability that XE is not picked. So I is not hit 
if all its elements are not picked. And this, you you can see is at least one minus. And again, I'm going to use the fact that I'm I'm going to use this inequality again and again. So you'll you'll you know one plus x is e to the uh, one plus x is at most e to the x. And I'm using this inequality again. And here, this summation is exactly, uh, this summation here is exactly the summation that we had previously on as a constraint. So this is one minus one over e. Okay. So any particular set is picked with probability one minus one over e, which is you know some 60 something percent. So there's still a 30% chance that any fixed set is not hit. So what can you do? So here is the actual algorithm. Repeat this sampling log m times. In this case, now what happens is you, you did the sampling log m times, right? So now the probability of this set not being picked is, let me just, each of these elements was not picked log m times. You tried them again and again and you failed each time. So you're going to get a log m. So you're going to get a log m out here. So this becomes one minus one over m. And now you can take a union bound over all sets. And maybe I'll, I'll make it so that uh, this is one over m squared. So I'll, I'll make it log m squared, which is just two log m. Okay. So the algorithm was, you know, we wrote down this LP and let me just write down the algorithm. So I said, repeat, uh, two log m times pick uh, s is pick each element independently with probability, let's say. Okay, so maybe SI is, uh, I shouldn't call this H, I should call this H sub T. So I, I, I sampled once, I got H1, I sampled again H2, I sampled again H of two log M. I took the union of all these guys, this is H. And the claim is that the probability that H is a hitting set is at least one minus one over I. Okay. There's a small probability that H is not a hitting set, in which case if H not a hitting set, what do you do? Well, let's say, you know, pick any hitting set. 
the cost of this is at most m, but happens with probability one over m squared, maybe. So the total expected total cost is two log m times the LP value plus one over m squared times m, which is at most order log m times the opt. Because the LP value is at most the optimal value. And maybe, you know, one is at most the optimal value. Okay. So the main idea that I want to uh, sort of mention out here is, what did we do? We did the relax and round. So what we said was, here is a hard problem. This is the same as an integer linear program. But I, you know, integer linear programs are hard because it captures this hard problem. I can't solve it. So let me relax it. This I can solve, but the solution doesn't make sense because these are fractional numbers. I want integers. I want zero one. So round. and you lose some factor out here. And this factor in this case was logarithmic. Okay. Anupam, can I ask yeah. a question? Please. So uh, I maybe, maybe I misunderstood something, but uh, I thought that the probability of one specific set not being picked was one minus one over M squared. So right? you are absolutely right, Jose. I made a mistake out there, right? So. The probability of good, the probability of any SI not being hit is at most one over M squared. You're absolutely right, thank you. So the probability that there exists an SI is not hit is at most M times one over M squared because of the union bound. Yeah, I initially thought of that when I wrote one over M and then I uh, made a mistake right there. Perfect. Yeah, a question also, uh, maybe this please is kind please. of irrelevant to what you're, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I, I, it's out of curiosity. Can you de-randomize this algorithm? Good. So you can de-randomize this algorithm and uh, you use, so if you're interested, you should look up the uh, idea of the method of pessimistic estimators. And so you can get a deterministic algorithm out of this thing. So, so if you didn't like the fact that we, this was a randomized algorithm, there are ways of getting rid of the random. No, no, I'm fine with that, <laughs> but it, it no, was no, no. curiosity. It, it was just curiosity. No, it, it is absolutely, I mean, it's a great question, right? What is the power of randomness? Mm -hmm. um, good. So maybe, you know, th this might be a sort of a good time to stop. Uh, here's, so the next time we'll talk some more about problems that we'll model either as hitting set, um, or we'll be solving hitting set directly. But there are some sort of generalizations that you know, if we had time, we'd talk about these. One of them is what if all the sets were of small size? Then it seems like maybe, I mean, if the sets were all of size one, you know the right answer, right? You, you need an element for every set. The problem is trivial. What if the sets were of size two? Now it turns out that this problem itself is hard. Vertex cover? It's vertex cover, exactly. And uh, so now the question is, for vertex cover, what can you do? And in fact, it turns out that you can get a one, you know, okay. So if all the sets are of size F, 
you can get an F approximation. Here's the trivial way of seeing that you can get an F approximation. Okay, solve this LP. Let's say that F is two. So every set is of size two. So it's somehow saying Xi plus Xj is at least one for every set Ij, for every you know set Ij, which belongs to the uh, collection. So one of these things, one of these will be at least a half. So here's the, here's the solution, take H to be all I, all E, all elements E such that X E is at least one half. Fair enough. What's the size of H? Size of H is at most two times X E. because you picked an element only if it was at least a half. And this is two times the LP value, which is at most two times the optimum value. Okay, so this gives you a two approximation, major open problem. I mean, in fact, if you solve this, uh, we'll probably, you know, you'll get your PhD and your next faculty job and all those sort of things and a couple of prizes on the way, do anything better than two. And this is this is a problem. It will if you could do anything better than a factor of two, this would disprove something called the unique games conjecture, which is a, a well known uh, sort of hardness conjecture right now. Uh, there are some other uh, things that uh, we can do with uh, this. I'm way out of time, uh, so I'm going to stop right now. And, but if you're interested, you can have a look at the next couple of slides. And if not, we'll, we'll talk about these later on. Uh, you know, what if I, every set had a requirement that, you know, set seven had to be hit, you know, 52 times. Set five has to be hit once, you know, stuff like this. How do you extend your algorithm? And for this, if you, you know, you probably have seen these things, uh, you know, I, I, I give you the algorithm, you know, you can, you can play with this if you want. You'll need something called a Chernoff bound, a large deviation bound, sometimes called a Hufting bound. These things have like a million names. So I don't know which name you've seen. If you haven't seen this, this is very nice. But I'm giving you like a idea of what kind of stuff you can do after this. Okay, anyways. Um, the best book right now um, on approximation algorithms is this book by uh, Williamson and Schmoyes. So if you want to dive more into this area, uh, this is a great book. It's, uh, it's and the, you know, one of the best parts is the PDFs available online. So uh, you can download it. If you like it, you can buy it. But uh, yeah, good. Okay, so let me stop here.